Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events, and I am pleased to welcome back our guest tonight. With a firm grasp of the delicacy and complexity of human relationships, Jody Picot has delivered number one New York Times bestsellers that are renowned for marrying controversial topics with nuanced characters and pitch-perfect descriptions of suburbia's fraught and precarious underbelly. As her writing both conceals yet reveals, she does this through immersive research. So whatever the topic or theme, she has a wealth of experience ready to hand. Her 23 novels include House Rules, Handle With Care, 19 Minutes, My Sister's Keeper, and The Storyteller, as well as the YA novel Between the Lines, co-written with her daughter, Samantha Van Leer. If you check the New York Times bestseller list this coming Sunday, you won't be surprised to see that JD, uh, JD's, Jody's latest novel was an instant number one bestseller, and it's the best-selling book in the country right now. In Small Great Things, Picot tackles race, privilege, prejudice, and compassion through the story of an African-American nurse and a white supremacist couple's baby. You'll find out more in just a moment. Tonight, Ms. Picot will be interviewed by Associate Director of Author Events, Laura Kovacs, who is also a thorough researcher and intrepid in the face of any topic. Please welcome Jody Picot and Laura Kovacs. Welcome back to the Free Library. It is an honor to share the stage with you. Thank you. Uh, this is a book, like Andy said, about race, privilege, power, and justice, among many other things. What sparked your interest in writing about race? I tried to write about race 25 years ago. I was living in New York, and there was a real-life story on the news that freaked me out, where an um, African-American undercover cop was shot four times in the back by a white colleague. And I really wanted to uh, create a novel based off that situation, and I tried. I tried, and I failed miserably. I couldn't seem to write an authentic situation, an authentic voice, authentic characters, and I really questioned whether I even had the right to do that. Very clearly, I'm a white woman. What on earth could I possibly tell people of color about their lives that they did not already know? So I put the book aside, and um, over the years, I would go back and I would say, I would play devil's advocate and say, well, you know, you write all the time as people you're not. You write as men, you write as, as Holocaust survivors, you write as school shooters, you're never gonna be those people. So what's different? And what was different is race. You know, racism is really hard to talk about without offending people, and so as a result, we often just don't talk about it at all. So then fast forward to 2012, and I came across yet another news story. This came out of Flint, Michigan. There was an African-American labor and delivery nurse with 20 years of experience on the ward who helped deliver a baby. And in the aftermath, the father of the baby called in her supervisor and said, I don't want her or anyone who looks like her to touch my child. And he pushed up his sleeve to reveal a swastika tattoo. In their infinite wisdom, the uh, hospital put a post-it note on the baby's file saying, no African-American personnel to touch this infant. The nurse and some colleagues banded together. They sued the hospital. I actually had the pleasure of meeting the attorney who represented her the other night at an event in Michigan. And um, I hope she got a really big payout. But it made me think, OK, what if that was the situation I was working with and things had gone differently? What if that nurse had been the only one alone with the baby when something went wrong and she had to choose between following her supervisor's orders or saving a baby's life? What if she wound up on trial as a result of that, defended by a white public defender who, like me, like a lot of people I know, would never consider herself to be a racist? What if I could tell the story from three points of view? The African-American nurse, the white public defender, and the skinhead dad as they all began to unravel their beliefs about power and privilege and race. And suddenly it was like the key turned in the lock and I knew I was actually gonna finish this. And it was because two things had changed dramatically for me my intent and my audience. I wasn't writing a book to tell people of color how hard life is. I was writing a book to tell people who look like me that although it's easy for us to point to the skinhead and say, that's a racist, it's a lot harder to point to ourselves and do the same thing. 
What kind of research did you do for this book? A lot. <laughs> So the thing about this book, and the reason this book has really affected me viscerally and personally, is because I couldn't ask all of you guys to unpack your biases unless I had done that myself. And I actually started, um, you know, as a woman who for 47 years had not talked about race, because I didn't have to. You know, that was a privilege, but I didn't know it back then. And I started by reading a whole bunch of stuff by racial justice educators just so that I could have a vocabulary to work with. And I'd never read those articles or books before. And then I decided to enroll in a racial justice workshop. And I went there thinking, I mean, how bad can this be? You know, I'm nice, I'm friendly, I'm open-minded. And I left there every single night in tears. And it was the stories that got to me. There was the Asian American woman who stood up and talked about her love-hate affair with eyeliner because she couldn't use it easily on her features, but it was the standard of beauty that she'd grown up with. And there was the African American woman who got up and said that every morning when she wakes up, she has to put on a mask, this metaphorical mask, so that she can go into the world and be the kind of black woman that other people need her to be. And how just once she'd like to walk out the doors herself. And I was really stricken by that. I, these are things I'm never going to have to ever think about. Once I knew I was going to create the voice of Ruth, I knew that in order to do it the right way, with compassion, with empathy, I was going to have to find women of color who were willing to overlook my ignorance about their lives and spend some time talking to me. And I did. I had a group of women of color who spent over 100 hours doing interviews with me. And they, again, came with their, their stories, their hopes and their fears and their successes and their failures and their stories. Um, one woman came in with her baby, her second son, the cutest baby on the planet. And he, she came to me the day after there was yet another shooting of an unarmed African-American man by a policeman. And she was very visibly shaken and said, how am I supposed to keep my son safe when he grows up? How do I teach my son to not be black? That was devastating. There was the young girl who had recently graduated from Vassar College who carried around a water bottle that said Vassar on it. And whenever she took public transportation, she would turn the word Vassar facing out on an empty seat so that as white people walked by, they would know she was safe to sit with. And again, these are things I never had to deal with. One of the women I spoke with asked me how often I talk about race with my kids. And I was like, oh, you know, I mean, when something happens in the news. And she said, mm -hmm, I talk about it every night. It's a matter of life or death. And then the last bit of research I had to do was to create another voice that was different from mine, which is Turk, the white supremacist in the book. And I actually began by speaking to two former white supremacists. One is a guy named Tim Zoll. He grew up in Orange County, California, and he, in the 1980s, ran with a very violent skinhead crew. And when he was um, w with these people, one night he beat up a gay man and left him for dead on the curb. Years later, when he got out of the movement, one of the first things he did was write a letter to the rabbi, the head of the Simon Wiesenthal Center, because as a skinhead, he'd written this guy a really offensive note, and he wanted to apologize. And the rabbi wrote him back and said, why don't you come work for me? So he went to go work for the Wiesenthal Center, talking every day about leaving a life of hate. One day he's in the cafeteria, and he looks up, and he sees the guy he beat up. And they made eye contact. They, over a period of months, sat down together. There were apologies, forgiveness. They kind of rebuilt a relationship. And um, now they are friends. They spend holidays at each other's houses. And every day they get up and they talk about their story together. The other man I spoke with was a guy named um, Frankie Mink, who is actually from Philadelphia, right here. And he ran with a skinhead crew here. He was the leader of a skinhead crew in Philadelphia. And at one point, he was sent to jail. And when he was in jail, he discovered that he had more in common with the young African-American kids than the white kids. So he would go to Bible study with them, and he would talk about the girls that he missed outside, the food he couldn't eat in jail. When he got out of jail, he had a job with a Jewish man. He took a job with a Jewish guy. And he had been told his whole life that Jews will try to cheat you out of everything that they owe you. So on the second to last day of his contract, he was called into the boss's office. And he was like, here it comes, here it comes. He's not going to give me my salary. And the guy said to him, you've done such an exemplary job. I actually would like to pay you double. And he began to realize how many, um, how many exceptions to the rule do there have to be before you realize that the rules are really wrong. 
And these guys explained to me that skinheads today are different than they were in their heyday of the 80s. Nowadays, skinheads do not shave their heads and walk around wearing suspenders and Doc Martens, and they're not roaming the streets of Philadelphia. They look like you and I. And they spend a lot of time online inciting fear and hate through online communities. They will go into towns and make it look like there are more of them than there actually are. Um, they might go to a temple parking lot and put the final call from the Nation of Islam underneath all the windshields to really upset people. Um, they said that there are still people who are planning for the racial holy war and are stockpiling weapons in rural places like New Hampshire, where I live. And in the summertime and late spring, you can still go to Aryan Independence Day and Hitler's birthday celebrations. And when you go there, you can pitch a tent and get a tattoo and listen to a white power band. And you can bring your kids and they can play games like pin the star on the Jew or hit a pinata that is an African-American man hanging from a noose. Um, you can go target shooting, and the targets are profiles of President Obama's face or Martin Luther King Jr.'s face. And I, I urge you to think that here we are in 2016, and somebody in this country is making those materials for these people. Um, you know, and uh, basically, they, they both wound up leaving a life of hate. And having these conversations with these men and doing these interviews really made me think, well, if they can have such a dramatic change of heart, can't the ordinary white person? How has your perspective on race <laughs> or privilege changed by writing this book? What did you learn? So much. Um, you know, I like I said, I spent 47 years not talking about race. And now, ask my children, it literally is all I talk about all day long. <laughs> and, um, you know, once you start seeing color, you can't unsee it. I learned that just because we choose not to talk about race, does not mean we're not part of the problem. I learned that it's more important to have a conversation and know you're gonna make mistakes. We all are. And to then say, I'm so sorry, thank you for teaching me that, I've learned and I'm gonna move forward now, than to not say anything at all. And I've learned that although it's pretty easy for us to see the headwinds of racism, the ways that people of color have a more circuitous path to success in America, we somehow are very blind to the tailwinds of racism, which are all the ways that having skin like my color make it easier for us to achieve success. The reality is that we don't like to think that. We like to think that if we're successful, it's because we worked hard or we had some good luck. But very often, if you've had an opportunity, it's a direct result of the fact that a person of color did not. And it might not be something you even know about. Like, you might have gotten an apartment because the landlord didn't want to rent to somebody black. You may never have known that, but you still got the apartment. Or it could be something like you tell yourself, I went to school, I went to a really good college, and that's because I studied hard, I did well on my SATs. And that's true, but it also could be because your mom was there to read to you when you were little and instill those values in you every night. And a person of color's mom was working two or three jobs and wasn't there. And that kid was playing catch up his whole life. And when you begin to see this and really unravel it, that American dream looks a little less dreamy. Is it more difficult to play, to portray the Turks' blatant racism versus the more institutional and systemic mm. racism? That's a great question. And the answer is they're both hard because um, Turk is difficult. When I wrote Turk, I would have to take a shower after I wrote his sections. And seriously, I'm not kidding. I felt so dirty after writing his voice because I would get to a point where I could type the N-word and I didn't even blink. And that made me sick. And I, would, I really just didn't want to be in his head very often. But you know, racism is big and messy and scary and, and institutional and systemic. But it's both perpetuated and dismantled in individual acts, which is something you see in the book, in the relationship between Ruth and her lawyer, Kennedy. And the thing about writing about all of the systemic and institutional racism, um, all of the implicit bias in the world, is that it hit really close to home. You know, I couldn't write Kennedy without admitting I had been Kennedy for a very long time. And that's hard. It's really hard to say, wow, I was really blind. I was like so blind. You know, and now I, I really am so much more aware than I, I ever was. And, um, and it's really, you know, it's, it's a really hard thing to do. I know it's hard to have a conversation about racism. I know it 
as a white woman because I've done it and I've been there and I know, I know everything you're feeling right now, that paralysis that you're gonna do something wrong. And one of the reasons I wrote this book is because it is a novel. Novels are bipartisan. It doesn't really matter what your views are on race. You read, everyone reads novels. And it's a really gentle springboard. You can read a book with someone whose opinions are totally different than yours. And you know, you just start talking to them. Oh, can you believe that Ruth did this? Oh my gosh, what about the twist at the end? And before you know it, you can then segue into, well, you know, that reminded me of this thing I heard on the news. And suddenly you are talking about race and it's just a little less in your face. You know, I love that hopefully this book can give you a tool to have the discussion that I'm trying to have. How, all of your fans know that the day after you finish a book, you're starting the next mm -hmm. one. How are you going to take what you've learned about race and about yourself and apply it to the books that follow Small Great Things? Another great question. You are on point tonight. <laughs> um, so first of all, and this is a really good example of what this book has done to me personally. Most of you know when I come and talk about a book, I'm already knee deep in the research for another book. I know exactly what I'm writing about next. I'm not telling you guys, but I know. Um, but I have not started doing the research or writing that book because I can't let go of this one yet. I can't let go of Ruth. I can't let go of this conversation. I think it's too important to dilute by drawing my attention away to something else that I'm interested in. And I will, I'll finish my tour someday and I will, I will start writing, but I, need, I really need to keep talking about this right now for myself as well as hopefully for others. Um, and I think the way that it's gonna affect me is this book was a little bit like climbing Everest. It was the scariest thing I could imagine doing because I really did anticipate pushback from many different communities. And I have to say that overwhelmingly the results that I've heard have been very, very positive from people who've read it. Um, I do think that people of color who read this book have a different experience than white people. That's totally cool. Um, it's still a book you're gonna enjoy either way. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. But for example, I was at an event mere minutes ago in Exton, Pennsylvania, and it was a sea of white people, white ladies at lunch, and there was one woman of color there. And she came up to me afterward at the signing and she said, my friend brought me here today and I didn't know at all what this book was about. And she burst into tears and said, you have no idea how validated I feel right now. And that means so much to me. It means that someone could hear what I had to say or read the book, I, I've had plenty of emails like that too, and say, you saw me, thanks for seeing me, thanks for having this conversation. And that is the best result and the best compliment I could ask for from someone of color who reads it. White people who read it are gonna be like, oh, 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 wait, that's me. And that's okay, you know, because that's exactly how I want you to feel. I want you to recognize yourself and I want you to think, Maybe it's time for me to start this path too, this journey. Can you talk about the title for the book and what it means to yeah. you? Yeah. Um, so this book was not called Small Great Things. It was actually called Living Color, and my publisher hated that title. So they told me to come up with a different title. And I gave them like 10 different titles and nothing was sticking. Nobody liked anything. And then one of my colleagues at a publishing company in uh, England came up with this title. It's based off a quote that is often attributed to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr which is, if I cannot do great things, I can do small things in a great way. And I loved that quote because it really felt like the heart of this book. You know, again, that idea that this is big. It's no one person is gonna change or get rid of racism in America. But if we as a white group of people begin to see that racism isn't an African-American issue, it's an everybody issue, that's taking a giant leap forward, and that's how we move the needle. And it is those tiny movements of the needle that move us forward, I think. Can you talk a little bit about the theme of parenthood in the novel? What mm -hmm. does being a parent mean to Ruth, to Kennedy, and to Turk? Well, they're all parents. And, you know, one of the things about race, of course, is that it's actually, a, as uh, Debbie Irving, who is a social justice educator, says it's a pigment of the imagination. Um, <laughs> race is not actually anything that you can flag by DNA, and we have more in common with people from different races than we do within our own race. And um, one of the things that these three individuals have in common 
is a, they're all parents and they all parent in different ways. And they all, what I, what I really find interesting about each of the characters is that they all make decisions for the best interests of their child, which I'm a parent and I would like to think that's you know, what I do too, but they don't always realize the ramifications of that. And you know, so Turk's life of white supremacy, for example, is done because he thinks he's securing the future for his white child, his little race warrior. Um, and I can tell you that the men who I spoke with, the reason that they both left uh, white supremacy had to do with um, the realization when they had kids that they were not doing their kids any favors. Uh, Tim Zoll, for example, he had his daughter at the supermarket. She was three years old, and they were in line, and there was an African-American man in the checkout line next to them. And his three-year-old daughter turned and said, Daddy, look at that big N-word. And the entire, the entire grocery store went, what? And people started screaming at him and saying, how dare you teach that to a baby? What kind of man are you? And he got so freaked out, he grabbed his kid and ran out of the store. And that was the beginning of the end for him because he realized, I'm not doing her any favors. I'm actually making her someone who is going to be hated. Um, so I think that what Turk thinks is not necessarily what's best. The same thing could be said for Ruth. Ruth is this African-American woman who has, her son is my favorite character in the book, Edison. And um, she has lived her entire life trying to make sure that Edison's life will be a terrific one. And to her, that means that when she was a kid, she was bused two hours to go to a very rich white private school, um, even though she lived in Harlem and her mom was a domestic servant to a rich family in New York City. Uh, when she went to college, she, she worked hard to get into college. She got her Yale nursing degree from an Ivy League school. She lives and works in a white community. She's one of the only black nurses at the small cottage hospital where she works. And the reason she chose actually to live in this very white community is so that when her son makes white friends and wants to have them come to the house, their parents can't say, oh, well, you know, you don't live in a very safe area because they live in the same town. And of course, Ruth thinks she's doing Edison a huge favor. And what unravels a little bit in the course of the book is the realization that Edison is, is sort of stuck with one foot in each world and he's not really part of either. Um, and that comes to a head very quickly when he has his best friend as a white kid who you know, he's been friends with forever, has taken him on vacation and then Edison wants to take this kid's sister to the prom. That is not cool. And all of a sudden he realizes I am other no matter what my mom thinks, no matter what I think, I'm not the same as them. Describe the first few weeks after releasing a book. <laughs> Has this book been received any differently in various parts of this country? Okay, the first few weeks after releasing a book are me being in a coma and a time warp <laughs> because I'm on book tour. And honestly, I don't think anyone can even explain to you what a book tour is. I, I don't know what day it is. I seriously do not know what day of the week it is. Does so someone feel free to tell me? I do know it's my brother's birthday. I realized that at about 11 o'clock this morning and I hadn't gotten him a card or a gift. But, um, you know, when you're on the road, you are living and breathing the book 24-7. And... I was really excited to do that because the whole idea was to reach so many different audiences and so many different people and hopefully inspire them to read this book and then take the conversation with them. You go now, you be my missionaries and go out into the world and keep talking about this long after I leave. Um, what I will say is that the emails I have received from both white people and from people of color have been so remarkable and so humbling that I keep sending them to my publishing company. And my editor said, she actually said the other day, we need to make a book of these. These are unbelievable. And they are, they're so moving from the woman who sent me this picture and said, you don't know what your book meant to me. Here is a picture of my family. And it was a picture of this white woman, her white husband, her white son, and her black adopted child. You know, and Stuff like that. Um, the woman who wrote me, who is an a, a African-American woman who is an ASL interpreter, which is a very white career, and she, was at, she told me this story. Everyone has a story to tell me in return. So she was asked to go uh, interpret at a church, a white church, and as usual, she was sitting across from the front row, which is what you do as an ASL interpreter, and a, an elderly white woman said very loudly, can you make her stop? I can't look at her black face anymore. And because it's her job, she had to sign that. 
So imagine what that does to you psychologically and emotionally. And for this woman to tell me the story and then to tell me how she got past that and woke up the next morning and did her job again is unbelievably inspiring. Um, and the other thing I've noticed, and this I kind of love, <laughs> now, now I'm going to actually be putting you guys on the spot, but at most of my events when I have done book launches in the past and we get to the Q&A sections, most of the questions are about other books I've written, about research, about my writing habits. Almost, I would say 85%, the questions are about race. And how do I do this? What would you suggest here? I'm a teacher and this happened. And that means to me that the audiences I'm facing so badly want to engage. These people want to have a conversation. They can't figure out how to start. So let me help you. I'm going to switch gears here, but only because I'm running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> and it does have to do with inequality. I'm wondering if you could briefly talk about your work with Vita. I'd love to. So I'm on the advisory board of Vita. Vita is an institution that um, crunch, it's an all volunteer institution, and they crunch numbers to reflect whether or not um, publishing is equitable or whether there's bias toward white authors or cisgender authors or um, authors who are not LGBTQ, you know, anything like that. Um, they actually started out by just looking at the discrepancy between men and women. And it was a really good fit for me because for many years I had spoken very vocally about the fact that there is gender inequity in publishing. And you know, a lot of people poo-pooed it. And then Vita came back roaring and they began to crunch these numbers and showed very clearly by looking at both review outlets for literature and reviewers that there are more male reviewers and there are more male reviews done of books, books written by men. And what was cool about this is that everyone kind of went, oh. And some places have worked really, really hard to move the, their reviews to, to make sure that there is gender parity, that there is equality and equity in the way that they review books. They've hired more women to do the reviews. Um, not all outlets are like that. Some are worse than others. The New York Times Book Review hired a woman to head it up, and she has actually you know, begun to move that needle. Tin House has done a great job of being 50-50 now. Um, but what Vita does is hold people accountable. And what they've done now is branch out to look not just at gender inequality, as I said, but also um, people who are writers who are disabled, writers who are transgender, writers who are LGBT, writers um, who are uh, anything but the white male norm. And they look at the intersectionality of all of this as well. And they, they crunch numbers. And once a year, they release this really cool report. And um, what I love about them is that you can run, but you can't hide when there are actual numbers. <laughs> so I was very, very honored when they came to me and asked me to be part of their advisory board, because I was talking about this stuff anyway. You've written two books with your daughter. What did you most want her to learn about the publishing industry or to teach her about staying in the driver's seat, professionally speaking? Oh, what a great question. Wow. Thanks. Do you want to come on the road with me? This is great. Yes. Um, so. I wrote two books with my daughter. I, honestly, what I would like her to learn is when to use a comma, because I don't think she's mastered that <laughs> skill yet. <laughs> and, um, but she is a really, really good writer. And the books that I wrote with her were a joy to write. They were also a hardship to write, because yes, she was a teenager. They were 100% her idea. And we literally sat side by side speaking the entire book out loud. I would say a sentence, she would jump in, we'd go back and forth, sometimes we'd talk over each other. We had some knockdown, drag them out fights, um, but it was a terrific experience. And we learned that we, our brains work very similarly creatively, which I find fascinating. I mean, there's gotta be a weird biology in that. And um, what I really hope that she has learned, and I know she has actually, is how to be true to her own voice and how to pace herself when she's writing. That is a really hard thing to learn. Um, and I can tell you about that this is, is a recurring lesson because she's currently writing her thesis at Vassar. And although she is an, a psychology and education major and tells me she doesn't want to be a writer, she's writing a creative thesis that is a YA novel. So you take of that what you will. And she sent me the first chapter um, about a week ago. 
And she was like, I'm having so much trouble. I don't understand why this doesn't feel right. And I started reading it and it was great, except I knew immediately the problem was that she knows everything about this book and her readers know nothing. And she was trying to make it all happen in the first 10 pages. And I said, okay, yeah, I called her up and we like, we had this little tutorial and she was like, oh God, yes, you're right. Which I have to say is always good to hear from your teenage daughter. <laughs> and, um, you know, and she just needed to be reminded, be slow, take a breath and let, let out the information in parcels, you know. And then once she did that, her revisions were great. Um, I also think finding your voice is not just about writing, but being uh, strong enough to advocate for yourself in the field of publishing. And she has done that. She is a young woman. She just turned 21. I have seen her completely hold her own with the head of a publishing company. Um, even more impressive is the fact that between the lines um, and off the page of, are being turned into a Broadway musical that we have been very intimately involved with and working with the book writer to develop from the original source material. And our producer is the producer for Kinky Boots on Broadway. She has won eight, or I think eight or 10 Tonys. And we, you know, Sammy comes into these meetings. She treks down there from Vassar. She's dressed very nicely, looks better than the rest of us. And at these meetings, she has absolutely no problem speaking her mind to this producer who is quite powerful and, um, you know, and it's funny, our composing team are two young women who are 29 and, and 28 and 29, and they look at Sammy like, how would you do that? Because they're terrified of Daryl. But she, you know, she just speaks her mind. And I do think that came from, from being young and being placed in a situation where at the table you had to advocate for yourself. So I'm really happy that she's got that skill. I think that's a really important thing for any young woman in today's society. My last question before sending this off to the audience, uh, who would you like to write your life story? I actually have answered this question. I am so impressed that I, I have an answer for this. Um, it is my husband's favorite writer, Nat Philbrick. He, first of all, he's the nicest man. Second of all, he looks just like my husband. They look like twins. And what I love about Nat is, of course, he's a historian, so he is well equipped to write a nonfiction book of my very boring life. But honestly, my life is not very exciting. I live, spend most of my time in an attic in New Hampshire working, and he has a talent for taking even the driest history and making it so incredibly readable and compelling. So that's why I want him to write my life story. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jody Pico. Thank you. <laughs> started or tried to write a book about race 10 years ago, mm -hmm. and you've written it now. I wonder if you could elaborate what you think happened during those 10 years <laughs> to make you able to do it now mm -hmm. as opposed to then. Well, I think two things happened. Um, I think that I grew up a little, and I was willing to see my complicitness in racism and how my silence was not doing anybody any good. And um, by getting a little older, maybe I got a little braver. You know, the truth is, when you're a starting out writer, um, criticism is very scary. And nobody likes to get a bad review or to hear nasty things or to get nasty emails from people calling you a race traitor. I've got those. Um, you know, and the truth is, I, I got to a point where it was more important for me to walk into that hot kitchen and know I was going to get overheated and just deal with it than to stay out of it. You know, I mean, I'm not allowed to complain. Honestly, I, I've gotten a lot of feedback, and I have gotten some feedback that is not too fun to read. It's very few and far between compared to, I think, the effect this is having. So I'm quite happy overall. But we all know the bad stuff stays with you longer. And yet, I tried really hard every time I read one to remind myself, you are the one who asked to do this, and you are not allowed to say it's too hot in this kitchen. You chose to go here. The other thing that I will point out is every single reporter who interviewed me for this book said, you have written such a timely novel. And I would actually argue, no, I haven't. This has been timely for 200 years. I've listened to a number of your books, and I, I've wondered, as an author, how you feel about giving up your work to another medium 
that I don't know if you have any say or control over the performances, mm -hmm. but how do you feel about that? So you're talking about audiobooks, right? Audiobooks. Yeah, so um, first of all, I think, I think audiobooks are like the wave of the future. I don't know, as people get stuck in traffic, they seem to be listening more and more <laughs> to them, right? And, uh, and I have listened to my audiobooks, mostly because I remember taking a trip to Canada and my husband hadn't finished re reading Leaving Time and we literally get in the car and he pops in this CD and I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> and he said, I want to hear the story. So I did get to listen to all that. Um, what I can tell you is I do have some say. When they cast an audiobook, they send me audio files of the actors reading different books. And it's weird, you know, because you think, you think you don't, imagine what these characters would sound like. I don't really cast actors when I'm thinking in my head about characters, but, um, but I can actually listen to a voice and say, no, actually, that's too cultured a voice for this character, or I kind of imagined a deeper voice. And, and so I do send them back to the drawing board and they'll come to me with new people. What I can tell you about this book um, in audio, Small Great Things, is that it is by far the most starry casting I've ever had. Um, the woman who is reading Ruth, and it was really important to me that Ruth be well cast, is Audra McDonald. <laughs> right? I know. I mean, and it was so funny is I've had people on this tour say, oh, the woman reading Ruth, you know, she's very good. I was like, yeah, she won five Tonys. I know that. Um, but she is just extraordinary, just extraordinary. I feel so lucky that she even wanted to do this. And apparently, she just had a baby. She had, had a little baby, um, Sally, a week ago. And she was like a thousand months pregnant when she was doing the audiobook. And they had to keep reminding her to take breaks because she has like this workhorse ethic. They said they'd never seen anything like her. Hi, I'm a Hi. fellow writer and I'm really interested in how you got your start. Really couldn't find it online, so I'd love to hear it from you. How I got my start? Yes. So um, I was very fortunate. I, I wrote a lot when I was a kid and I went to a high school where I had teachers who encouraged me to do creative writing and I wanted to go to an undergraduate school that had an undergrad creative writing program. Um, I'm old, so I went in the 80s and uh, Princeton happened to have one and I was lucky enough to get in there. And I worked almost exclusively with Mary Morris at Princeton, who honestly is the only reason that I am here today. Uh, she was really tough on me, but she, I needed that. And she really made me the writer that I am. When I was at Princeton, I had two short stories published in Seventeen magazine because Mary told me as I finished them for a class, go send them somewhere. And I mean, I thought I was writing these for a grade. And I sent them off to Seventeen and I heard um, back from this editor and she said, we want to pay you for your short story. And I was like, really? Because I'd pay you to take it. And, um, <laughs> and, she, uh, and she did. She bought one, and then she bought a second one before I graduated. And, um, and it was amazing. And that was when I called my mom up, and I said, I'm going to be a writer. And she said, that's awesome. Who's going to support you? <laughs> and I did not become a writer. I graduated from college, and I worked on Wall Street. I wrote um, Standard and Poor's and Moody's uh, documents. They were 400 page documents. I was working for Solomon Brothers and I was writing about these companies and to try to get them good ratings. At one point I knew more about fiat than anybody on the planet. And um, I was so excited in October of 1987 when the stock market crashed because it meant I was going to get a severance package. And I left, moved to Massachusetts where the guy I was dating was living. It was a good call because I married him. And, um, and over a period of years, I had multiple jobs. I, had, I worked as a textbook publishing editor. I got a master's at Harvard in education. I taught at a private school. I taught creative writing at a private school. I worked at an ad agency and I taught eighth grade English all in a period of two years. And I got married and I got pregnant because I'm an underachiever. And, and then the whole time I had all these jobs, I was still writing. Because, you know, if you're a writer, you write, even if you're not published. So, like, for example, at the textbook publishing company, I used to finish all my work by 10 o'clock, and then I would close my door and pretend I was super busy, and I would write my novel instead. <laughs> and um, I wound up using those two years to try to get an agent. I had over 100 rejection letters from agents. Finally, a woman uh, who had I'd done a reading series at one point that she ran, and she was becoming an agent. And I sent my book out to her, and she said, I haven't represented anybody, but I think I can represent you. And I was like, okay. And um, she sold my first book in three months, and that was Songs of the Humpback Whale. And the reason I've kept writing is because it's a lot easier than teaching eighth grade English. <laughs>
Speaking of Princeton, I would direct the audience to your website to hear your Princeton Day speech last year. It is one of the most beautiful and inspiring speeches I've ever heard. Thank you. Uh, one of the key lines that you say in this speech that I wonder if you would just address is, comfort is not an inalienable right. Right. Comfort's not an inalienable right. It's a privilege. And I think that it resonates so well with, with this particular book as well. Um, if you have skin the color of my skin, you are used to always having your opinion matter. You are used to always having a seat at a metaphorical table and to speaking up and knowing somebody will listen. That is not the case for all people in America. And sometimes the role of the white ally, the people who look like us, if you really want to make a difference, is to do this because you are handed the microphone all the time. Can you hear me? Okay, and then you pass it to someone whose voice hasn't been heard. That is probably the most important thing you can do. And you know, I, I've been getting a lot of questions about this. What does that really mean? How do I enter this dialogue? Well, there are lots of ways you can do it, and it depends on the venue and the life you live. If you work at a business and you are at a meeting and you see that most of the people talking are a bunch of old white guys, you know, and yet Jane, who's a person of color, is sitting there pretty silent, you can be the one to say, you know, I ha we haven't heard from Jane yet. I'm really curious. I'd really love to know her opinion on this. And draw someone into the conversation if they haven't been given that space to speak yet. Um, if you have a second grader, go into your second grader's teacher or write an email and say, what kinds of African American history are you teaching this year? Uh, is it just about slavery? Is it just the African American as a victim? Is there any way you can find some heroes in African American culture to teach as well so our kids get to know them? Um, even if you're white and the teacher's white, it's even better if you're the one asking. So, you know, find that space and realize that because you have that seat at the table, that comfort, that is something you're blessed to have. A lot of people don't get that opportunity. And the best thing you can sometimes do with that comfort is offer it to somebody else. First of all, thank you so much for uh, sharing your great talent with all of us, great, your admirers here this evening. Well, thank you. Yeah. So, many, so many people are closet writers and they don't put it out there. Um, you told us that you were having difficulty letting go of this book. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, perhaps, maybe there is a continuation of this book <laughs> in, inside oh, of you. Oh, you wish. I, I have not read the book. <laughs> I have not read the book. I don't know what the conclusion is, but I'm thinking in my head as I'm sitting here that maybe you need to move it into the next generation of these people. Well, I promise you at the end of the them. book, you will know what happens to them. Okay. There is enough resolution that you know what the future holds for these characters, um, which I think will satisfy you. Okay. And I know that I tend to write, um, I don't write sequels unless I'm writing apparently with my daughter, but I do, I do sometimes bring characters back whose stories I haven't finished telling yet. I feel pretty confident about the main characters in this book. That's not to say an ancillary character might not pop up in a different book. But what I will say is, you know, as a white writer, it's a big thing right now when you think about writing other, when you write outside your voice and outside your lane. And this in particular in publishing is a very big debate right now. And nobody is telling white writers, do not write something that is not you. I mean, frankly, no one's gonna stop you. Um, what people are really trying to say is understand why you're writing this story. Um, is it to profit off somebody else's oppression or is it because it's something you need to say for some reason that requires you to use a voice of color in some way or something like that? And if that's the case, then do your homework, do your research, and make sure that you listen to the actual voices of people who are living in this oppression. And also make sure that you get them to vet your attempt at it to make sure it's accurate. Like those are all the really good steps you can take if you are gonna write other. I can tell you, I had one of the most interesting emails that I received um, after the publication of this book was from Joyce Maynard. Do you know who she is? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I've never met Joyce Maynard. And she wrote me to say, I just heard one of your interviews. You are so brave. In all my life, I've never written a black character because I am too afraid to write it. And I think to some extent, I know a lot of white writers who are really scared of that. 
I'm not scared of that anymore because I feel like I know how to do it. So I think even if you don't see the characters in this book, you will see a much wider range, I hope, of characters in I my books. I want to talk to you about your technique of always talking through more than one character mm -hmm. that you do in pretty much all of your novels. Um, I know that a while ago I read a novel that you had written probably fairly early on in your career and you didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering how did you develop that and, and why do you think that's important in your novels to do that? I will write in multiple points of view because first of all it's fun, it keeps me on my toes. Um, you should be able to open any page of my books, read a first person narrative and know who's talking. And you know, for example, when you read this book, Turks syntax is very subject, verb, object. That's very um, intentional. Ruth has the most beautiful writing. I saved all my best metaphors for her. And, um, you know, and each of the characters will sound grammatically different um, as well as in, in terms of the things that they're talking about, the actual issues. Uh, when I'm writing about something very controversial, I almost see this as an easy cheat because two people, two characters may have very, very different points of view. So how, what better way to espouse those two very different points of view than to give them both airtime, um, you know, or three points of view in this case. Uh, to me, it, it's a very natural thing to do. That said, there are some books I won't tell that way. Usually it's because I'm asking you to do something else that's complicated, like jump back and forth in time. Um, if I'm doing something that is structurally complex, I probably will not also throw in multiple narrators because I don't want you to be working that hard that you missed the whole story. Um, I can tell you that for right now, the book that I'm writing next is not going to have multiple voices for that reason. So look at that. You'll be able to read another one soon. <laughs> Hi. You already kind of addressed what I was going to ask, but it is about the writing other. Mm -hmm. The um, big criticism of that is that when you write other, if you're writing the story of a minority character, that you're taking away the voice of... Um, 100%. A, the, yes, the, an author or mm -hmm. in TV, that's a big thing. What would right. you say to that, and does it ever feel like uncomfortable, like maybe this really isn't my story to tell when mm -hmm. you're writing? Yeah, and you should always be asking yourself that if you're writing other. And ultimately... Um, I had a really interesting experience that happened to me when I was writing this book. I read ta Coates' Between the World and Me. Unbelievable book. I literally went back to my bookstore, bought 10 copies, and handed them out to people. And I read it in one sitting, okay? I love that book. And I have a friend who is an African-American woman, one of the women who did research with me, and we have many, many conversations about race, like all the time, because that's all I talk about. And. Um, I said to her, I love this book. She goes, I know, isn't it great? I said, I'm going to tweet at him. I'm going to tell him how much I love this book. And that was about the same time that ta Coates went on Twitter to say, yeah, all you white critics who love this book, I don't really care. <laughs> and it was a very interesting thing because I went right back to my friend. I'm texting her and I'm like, I want to tweet at him because I like hearing when people like my book, but I guess he doesn't really want to hear from me. Why do you think he doesn't want to hear from me? That's really strange. I don't understand it. And she went, mm-hmm. And I said, well, I mean, I, I, I just, I know he said in the book that he's writing for an audience that looks like him. I mean, I get that. But, you know, wouldn't you still want to hear from people who enjoy your book no matter what the color of their skin? And she goes, mm-hmm. And I go, oh, it's not about me. <laughs> and I was like having this huge moment of realization. You know, ta Coates did something really important. He wrote to a community that looked like him to talk about how expendable black bodies are in America right now. And it was a, a call to arms and a, a, a rise to justice for the African-American community. And once I could take myself and my own hurt out of the equation, I realized he had taught me a really important lesson, which is you are writing for your own community. And that's not to say that I don't think or want people of color to read this book, because I do think it's validating experience. But mostly the people who need to read the book are not people of color. The people who need to read the book are people who look like the two of us. And, and I'm okay, I'm comfortable in that because I understand that when you are an ally, you are supposed to be talking to the people who look like you and in the communities where you fit. Um, and I think, you know, I learned that really by reading ta book. It was a real sort of light bulb moment for me. I think that 
if you are writing a book that you think is someone else's story to tell, you shouldn't write it. But I also think that me as a white woman writing to talk about how white people are implicit in racism is very different than a person of color's take on the same thing. The other thing that I think is critically important, I say this on my website, I say this in the author's note, is that the highest compliment you could give me is to put down small great things when you're done, run back to your bookstore or library and get a book written by an author of color. Because I can approximate what it's like to live in America if you're Ruth, but I will never be Ruth. And there are so many amazing authors of color every day doing that so, so well. And here's the other thing, if you're white, that's a great way to check your implicit bias. When you read, do you read mostly white authors? What does your bookshelf look like? Or are you reading a white author and then an author of color and then a white author and then an author of color? And if you're not, you're missing out on some incredible voices. You're missing out on people like Colson Whitehead and Jesmyn Ward and Jacqueline Woodson and Britt Bennett and Celeste Ng and Sherman Alexie and ta Coates and Gloria Naylor and I could keep going. There are so many incredible voices out there. And if we only read the people who look and sound like us, we're never gonna grow. If you really wanna expand your mind, read them. <laughs> A reader and writer, I unfortunately teach eighth grade English, so oh. I am. <laughs> yeah. First off, I would love it if you were ever able to write a piece of fiction that I would be able to take into the middle school classroom okay. setting. I know it can be a scary place for me and them as well, but my question for you, obviously you don't need me to tell you how many books you have written, that is amazing. However, of all the voices that you have created and all the characters, and obviously you know the importance of it, has there been one voice that has really stuck out for you or that maybe um, ha was really hard to let go of all, all of the characters? There are a lot of characters that I have trouble letting go of um, whose voices, there are some write voices I love to write because they were just super fun. Uh, Serenity from Leaving Time was a blast. Ian Fletcher from Keeping Faith was terrific. Patrick Ducharme is always fun because I have a crush on him. Um, <laughs> but. You know, then there are some voices that I miss because, or characters I miss, because I feel like I want to know what happened to them. Chris Hart from The Pact is one of those. I still think about Anna Fitzgerald every now and then. Um, and Ruth, Ruth really got to me. She really got under my skin. And I, I, I'm obviously, I'm not ready to let her go yet. I, I can't miss her yet. Um, but those are the characters that really get to me. To answer your earlier question, you too can teach race in your classroom. And what I would recommend you do is get Shine, which, uh, no, I'm sorry, not Shine, I, I'm lying. You could teach Shine, actually, yeah. Shine is, an right now it's only an audio segment. Um, it's one that can be downloaded, and uh, it probably will wind up published in the paperback eventually. It's the prequel to Ruth's experience. It's when she is a third grader and she goes to Dalton, the Dalton School for the first time. And it's really, the first experience she has of not fitting in and what it means to be a black person in a white world. Um, and that is a great, great story for kids that they can tap into. Uh, the other one I wrote, which is a standalone piece, is called The Color War. And that was also available um, in audio, but I think it's been printed in some overseas versions, you can probably find a bootleg. And, um, and that was about a, a young boy who goes to a fresh air fund, an African American boy who goes to a fresh air fund camp. And one of the highest, most amazing moments of my career was doing an interview with Beverly Daniel Tatum for this book. She is an incredible racial justice educator and she used to be the president of Spelman College and finding out quite coincidentally that that short story was taught at Spelman College. So um, by all means, get your hands on that. It is absolutely appropriate for eighth graders and it will spark a lot of discussion. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much for being here.